go right here. Oh, well, hi, Dee Dee. <laughs> so good to see you. I haven't seen you. Shirley Bush Ellsberg, the Board of Trustees, staff and volunteers of the Nelson II, where will be a fascinating conversation with one of our greatest local heroes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and some of you know the drill of these art tastings, and they began about sharing, and so this is really going to be an informal conversation, like the kind of conversations. Richard and I would have at a normal bar. But I asked him, <laughs> I asked him, so what, what do you like drinking? And what are you longing for when you come back to Missouri? He says, there is this bourbon that I absolutely love from Western. <laughs> and, and, and so you see, it, it, it's the, the home that it's calling when I'll be pouring this. So how do you like it? Neat and with a bit of ice? Just water. Just water? I wasn't quite that enthusiastic. <laughs> oh, so your taste has evolved since? No. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, and there's another thing and, that I will reveal. Uh, so, cheers. <laughs> cheers. So, we're going to have a great time. <laughs> I'm so sorry we could not share this. There's something like legal liability that really starts spreading. Hmm. Anyway, I brought something special called fromagine, huh? so we can snack and, uh, <laughs> and, and and this fromagine are, and this is the reason why I got them and discovered them is because thanks when I was applying for my position here, we happened to be together at uh, the director's meeting, and that was in Florida uh, on a winter day, and. When we started discussing that, from that meeting I was coming here to for one of my interviews, he says, Julian, there's three things you need to know about Kansas City. I mean, the most important thing, where are you staying? And I said, oh, I, I think they're putting me on the intercontinental. Oh, the first thing you do, just drop your baggage, go up the hill, and you're going to see a beautiful, most beautiful park, Loose Park. I'm taking notes, Loose Park. <laughs> then go to the left, and there's a school called Pembroke. Go on pilgrimage to Pembroke. So I did. How many of you Pembroke alums here? <laughs> Fabulous. Well, the reason we're lucky to have him here today is because that <coughs> element, the Pembroke Hill School, is celebrating a 50-year reunion. And tomorrow they're giving him the distinguished award as the boy who made it well internationally. <laughs> <laughs> And then a third tip, he says, and you know, there is a place called Chez Andres where you have chocolates and, and this. If you tell the board that you've already been Chez Andres, they'll give you the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, I went and bought chocolates and everything. And today it's my honor to present a lot of chocolates <laughs> because I didn't get the job. <laughs> Amazing, amazing time. But every time we have conversations, my surprise is that you know more about Kansas City than if you were living here. <laughs> and so I know that the roots, the pleasure. So tell us, and let's go for a survey of how you started the art, why the arts, and what is Kansas City to you? Because Kansas City seems still to be kind of heat. That's true. Thank you, Julian. And thank you, Andre. <laughs> um, I grew up in Northeast, and uh, we would say, let's go to the museum, especially my father who's here tonight, who just celebrated his 94th birthday. <laughs> so we go to the museum, and this was our idea of the museum. It's the one on Gladstone Boulevard near our house, but we'd go there, we'd go sled riding, we'd look around, we even used to walk our stilts there because we weren't tall enough. And then, when I was about 9 or 10, I started taking piano lessons 
at the old Conservatory of Music, which was where the Kemper is today. And um, that was the Stoker House. And I had a very difficult teacher. I'm sure he felt the same way about me. But afterwards, I'd walk around and go to the Art Institute and then come over to this building, which I didn't know so much about. And I knew at that moment it was called the gallery, not the museum. So we went to the museum on Gladstone Boulevard and we came here less frequently, but I did come here. And I liked some of it. And even today I went through that wonderful Buddhist, Chinese Buddhist temple. And that's really what I remember most from when I was a kid. Because to me that was the original shock and awe. And even today I thought how fantastic it is. So the museum became sort of part of my life. And when I started going to Pem Day, and my orthodontist was nearby here. It became more of my life. And then we had a very active glee club in those days, and our Christmas program was in Kirkwood Hall. So we thought this was part of our property, I suppose. In any case, I was looking around. I really, I was a very bad student, as I was telling you today, and didn't know, I thought I would be a journalist. And that turned out to be more difficult than I thought. But I couldn't get into college, so I went to a place. You would be unemployed today. I know. Okay. So, so <laughs> you're not going to part with this. We're still holding to this. Good trajectory. Yeah. So I went to a school near Chicago at a place called Lake Forest. That wasn't quite as interesting as Pem Day, so I left there very quickly and went to France. And there's nothing else to do in Paris except go to museums. So in a way, I was looking very a lot from the time that I moved to Paris, which was 1968, and I lived there off and on for about 18 months, and lived also in Dijon, mm -hmm. which was a very good spot for wine and art as well. So that's the so late... So 1968 in Paris is also the moment of the story. No, I got remember. there when it was over. Oh, oh. So. <laughs> you missed the that. Yeah. My timing typically is a little bit off, so it was three months later, but that was just as well because I wouldn't have known what to do in that chaos. Mm -hmm. I was living there in 1970, when the demonstrations against Cambodia began. Mm -hmm. And then I got in the swing of things. So came back to Lake Forest, came back to Kansas City for a year, and did a lot of different things. But one of them was working for the Westport Trucker as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And after getting paid $10 an article, I realized this is not going to take me very far. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd heard about uh, the Whitney program in New York because it, originally it was a program to train people to become curators. There was an alliance between three schools, Allegheny College, which is near Pittsburgh, Lake Forest College, and Colorado College. So this, I went there, this was, whoops, 1960, 1972, I guess, and they were friendly, and I got, I think, a head start in a way on becoming a curator, and I'm not sure I even really knew what that was exactly, but I knew quickly after moving to New York that I liked being around artists, and my roommate in college had been a painter, so I understood better what it was to live in a studio after being with him, and still see him, and he's coming down this weekend. Um, that lasted for three years. I had a very good mentor called Marcia Tucker, who's a bit of a well-known curator from those days. She said to me, you have to go into exile. So I'll find jobs for you. So she found me a job at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. or the La Jolla Museum, this one in California. The Cincinnati job paid $11,000 a year. The La Jolla job paid $10,000 a year. So I called my dad, and he said, what are you going to do? Because I thought I should take the higher salary. Mm -hmm. And he said, what are you going to do with the extra $1,000? Drive up and down the Ohio Turnpike. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't quite look like this. It was Helen, Ellen Scripps house right on the beach and uh, had a bit of a reputation in Southern California. But living there for three years gave me the opportunity to know California, which I hadn't really known previously. So I went many weekends to Los Angeles and went to studios and got to know artists there. And both those artists that were the, the movement that was coming between in yeah, really, I, I sort of concentrated on the my generation, so it was Chris Burton, mm -hmm. Alex Smith, and then I got to know Rouchet and mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Irwin and even San Francis a little bit later. So at the beginning, I would make a very methodical uh, itinerary and go to studios mm -hmm. every Friday and Saturday in LA. But and what, what was the kind of programming that this was It was completely was contemporary. It was all yeah. contemporary. So, I, for example, I did a Kim McConnell show there. We did a lot of sort of big group shows that were mostly about California. But it was an ambitious place that still is today. Mm -hmm. And it's become a lot more, shall we say, fancy mm -hmm. from my day. So this was a nice, I'm sorry for how trashy it looks, but <laughs> it's a 1911 house by Irving Gill. And it's one of the first buildings that's built in a tilt slab. So he poured everything on the ground in concrete and then lifted it up and made this kind of Spanish quotation. He's a really fine architect. And I had a good time living there, and I could even swim to work. <laughs> <laughs> so that allows you, you can do that in Venice, too, at the Peggy Boogie. Which, which body of water? <laughs> so I really wasn't getting along well with the director and left after a while, after three and a half years, moved to LA. And I lived there for a year, and that's when MOCA was being organized. And I was invited by Sam Francis and Bob Irwin to be on the artist committee to organize the new museum. And that was an interesting 11 month interlude. And I taught for the first and last time mm -hmm. at Claremont College. You taught at Claremont uh -huh. Yeah. And that was really very difficult for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, whoops, there's one missing. Oh, then I went back to the Whitney, sorry. So I left California and came back to New York, and there I stayed for 12 years, and it was a relatively happy moment. This great director, Tom Armstrong, was in charge, and he was very open to younger staff people, so we had lots of opportunity to do things. There was, there, was, there was confusion about nepotism. Tom Armstrong, Richard Armstrong, was there something there? Uh, occasionally. Occasionally, yeah. yeah. But he was so unique, no one thought that I was here. <laughs> So that was 12 years all through the 1980s. So what, 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 what were moments that you recall of, of, of those years? Well, one thing that was very interesting because it forced you to travel was mm -hmm. I think I organized either four or five Whitney Biennials. And then, so, so, so I'd go to you know, studios everywhere, mm -hmm. including here, but it gave me a chance to really get to know the U.S. that way. And what was it for you to be organized? I mean, that is a great privilege today to be one of the curators of the Whitney Bay. You did three or four. You know, what's wrote. really charming about me? Mm -hmm. I just presumed it was my right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was especially unusual. So, so, so if a young curator shows up to you today and presumes it's his or her right, then I look at them and I think, you've got some power. Fabulous. All right. You <laughs> might get out of the way. I'm using this, taking notes, and you might see my museum director chops increased thanks to this conversation. So well, that's why I would also say it was a much more open world in 1973 because I barely got through that one college and I never went back and I never had an MA or a PhD or anything and yet people kept offering me jobs. So so do you think education is getting on the way? I think that today? I think a lot of things have become overly systematized mm -hmm. and they've become a kind of echo of academic life. Mm -hmm. And we might be a little bit too focused, I think, on footnotes and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think really, in the case of an, someone who likes contemporary art, the first attribute has to be that you like contemporary artists also. Mm -hmm. And then it helps to be able to write and have a big vocabulary. So your education was also because you were traveling. It was more serious My studio. education was utterly empirical in, in the arts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So there's 12 more years at that place. Sadly, they've left it and moved downtown in New York to a Renzo Piano building. But I think this is still a great, great place on 75th and Madison, designed by Marcel Boyer. Did you, were you part of, still when also they had started to have satellites and what yeah. was it? The yeah, well, there, we had 55 Water Street, which mm -hmm. was on Wall Street, and we would, make small shows down there. And that was really, I was with another person mm -hmm. in charge of that. And then we opened another one in Midtown, and it's ultimately Midtown. in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So there were kind of branches everywhere. The problem is they were all interconnected with corporations. So they had a kind of not perfect 
profile, or, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. But it helped the Whitney gain a new audience. And it also helped the Whitney stay moderately solvent, as it never was. And today, this building is now occupied by the Met. Yeah, just for seven years, and it's a lease. And the Whitney, in theory, will go back there, and they'll have two locations, which I think really? is unlikely. Yeah. Yeah, unlikely. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about the economics okay. of the museum world later. Whoops. I already did that. OK. So then I left New York, and I went to Pittsburgh, which seems unlikely, but it's a wonderful spot. But maybe, maybe many people here has visited you during your picture. And any show of hands, who visited Pittsburgh? Who has been to the Carnegie Museum? Yeah, we have a good crowd that follows you. So, right. You know, it's an interesting place. It's an amalgamation of the Central Library, a big music hall that seats 1,700 people, uh, a natural history museum, and an art museum. So it's four blocks long, and it really is quite an amalgamated grand place with his name on it. This is a wing that was put up around 1970 that's occupied exclusively by the Museum of Art. So I went there because they have this exhibition every three or four or five or six years called the Carnegie International, which began in 1895. It's meant to be a kind of survey of contemporary from around the world for an audience that doesn't have a lot of information. So that was that was also your first directorial job. But no, this I'm still a curator. Oh, you're still, I'm still curator. happy at that point. You're still happy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> so I went there in 1992, and the idea would be to make the Carnegie International in 1995, which was the hundredth anniversary of the exhibition. So big privilege and very nice. Mm -hmm. And I would say, if you look back on it retrospectively, going to the Whitney allowed me to get to know America well in terms of the arts. And going to Pittsburgh allowed me to get to know the world well because it was an unlimited budget for travel. Mm -hmm. And it's a very well-funded you know, exhibition. So I did that in 1995, and I thought I'd show you a couple of slides. So I'm sorry it's truncated. This is a, a wonderful place called the Hall of Sculpture in this 19th century building that's a bit of a replica of a Greek space, and you see a plaster copy of a frieze from the Parthenon around the ceiling. And in any case, on the floor down below, I showed Donald Judd's work, a good Kansas City artist. And he had never been seen in Pittsburgh, which I found astonishing. And he died the year before this in 1990. So that was sad, but I think good justice. Then upstairs, these are there were about 40 photographs by Cindy Sherman who was a good friend, and unfortunately she was in that period where there was a lot of blood and gore and photographs, and I heard frequently from the nice ladies of Pittsburgh, what a shame that they're in the exhibition. <laughs> then in that new building, you come up the set of stairs from the parking lot, and this is, I put it in here because this is an interesting Thai artist called Rick Rid Tiravania, mm -hmm. who became much more well-known, but the function here was that we cooked rice every day and fed people who were coming up from the parking lot because that's a replica to the exact dimensions of his gallery in, so in, Chelsea, in Soho. And he did this first in Soho in 1990. So and it is, that is the beginning of what is now. Participatory social exactly. art. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, participatory. Unfortunately, the relational aesthetics right. that people have to be And he's become one of the most influential artists. I, I love doing this. I hated making the rice. <laughs> and so I asked someone making else. It's better, but eating it? If you make it? Now that's a question. It's like maybe well, bigger it's gone. Is. Uncovering his culinary talent. Any comments on his culinary talents? There are none. He likes rice. Okay. <laughs> but the big problem here was there was no kitchen and no running water, and it, you were really eating it at your own risk. And then later, I went to the attorneys in the museum and could have killed someone. <laughs> Actually, yes. Yeah. No, I think but we did. But you did. You were at Basel this year. We were together there, yeah. and uh, you saw that also the big participatory piece now is taking this kind of more intimate in the steel yeah, and it was in, in the Basel big um, Forum One yeah. big installation but that was now uh, Gupta the 
yeah. in the darkness, <coughs> creating a whole room, also cooking. So cooking, the participatory elements, and maybe we'll touch upon later, art as an experience more than just as a... I didn't know that. As a I didn't know that I like Rick Ritt, so yeah. I did this in... You know he was born in Argentina, by the way? Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. His father was in the diplomatic corps. Exactly. But I knew I liked it, I didn't know what it meant, and believe me, no one in Pittsburgh knew what the heck they were doing, so... So in Pittsburgh, did you look... As an Asian artist or as a Latino artist? Being born in Argentina. Definitely an Asian artist for us. <laughs> so that was the period, that was... 1995, then one day I'm going to a board meeting and I get a, I come home because I've been to the airport to pick up an artist and I got a phone call from the newspaper saying, how do you feel about the director of the museum having resigned? Well, he forgot to tell me. <laughs> so who was the director then? Somebody called Philip Johnson. So I felt a little bit of drift and I think I called my dad again and he said, well, you better apply for the job because you're going to be fired otherwise. <laughs> So I did. Really the bias, really. <laughs> you know, I have to be, and go to the farm with your father more because he's giving you great advice. <laughs> so Maybe, I, sir, would you help me too? <laughs> I mean, some it's advice. A big, it's a very good I know it. <laughs> so I, I applied for the job, and literally it was six feet away from my office to the director's office. But it was such a different um, set of responsibilities. And I must say, I wasn't popular with the other curators. And they, <laughs> they had tried to block me, so I thought, hmm, I must be really a bad person. But I realized that they were jealous of all the attention that the Carnegie International got. Mm -hmm. So I went from office to office and said, what is it that you would like to do that's as important as that? Mm -hmm. And four out of the five people had good ideas, and we did all of them. And the fifth guy I fired. <laughs> so that was 1992. So just the statistics, four out of five loved it. Okay, just just. And so how many years? It was, it, four out of five had good ideas. <laughs> but it was good because I wanted them to be ambitious, and I wanted the museum to raise up its profile. So that was 1992 until 95 and then in 96 I became the director and it was so comfortable I stayed there for 12 years almost asleep mm -hmm. but it was interesting and hey, three more internationals happened three more yeah so first I hired Madeline Grinstein to come now the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago she director. She's a dad. so okay but hold on for one second so you become director yeah and all of a sudden the responsibilities do shift and all of a sudden you say, you could have said, I'm going to do the next ballet game, or no. triangle. No. But you said, let's hire someone outside. And how does Madeline Grinchan come to your rather stream? She's not working for the Carnegie at the time. No. She's outside. Well, so I left out one of my jobs. When I was at the Whitney, mm -hmm. I also ran the independent study program Which that I had been in in 1973. Mm -hmm. So every year I had 10 really ferociously bright kids from all over the world trying to become young curators, and she had been one of them. That's how I met her. And she was one of the brilliant Yeah, so I think I did that for like six years. It was really difficult. And it is still a program that's still going on, and it is a great yeah. program. And that's how I met Rick Rick, because it's not only trains curators, it helps young artists have studios in New York, and he came to do that program, and we became friendly there. So anyway, I became the director in 1996. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And then I stayed there for 16 years. No, 12 years. 12 years. I'm so bad at math. <laughs> you know that is something we have in common. <laughs> <laughs> now the difference is my dad was a mathematician. <laughs> and he couldn't understand why I didn't get any of the DNA. But then, so then, then but no, let's, let's focus a little bit more. 16 years, it is a community still, I mean, and, and the Carnegie is one of those places that we all think about. Because the collection that it has gathered over yeah. like more than 100 years, of, and in many ways, there's one thing that, just show of hands, who remembers seeing here the World's Fairs exhibition? Um, that 
Kathleen Fuller was planning already when, as I was coming here, director, and when I saw that project, also it's like one of the greatest shows. And thanks to the fact that Richard was at the carnival then, we partnered and that show flourished and traveled throughout the country. But uh, that was an amazing project. But then I realized when I went to the to, to, to visit the carnival that the collection of modern contemporary art that is now stellar is because also from the very get-go you were acquiring works of art from every of those places. Right, well, you remember the motto of Andrew Carnegie, <laughs> by the old masters of tomorrow, which is basically a way of saying, I'm not giving you any more money. <laughs> well, I hear that constantly from most of my donors, but how, how, how can you build a great collection with that motto? You make great exhibitions beginning in 1895. You buy, like, the first picture they bought was a Winslow Homer. Mm -hmm. It cost $3,000. Which is the contrary of what we have to do, or we had to do at the time, because of, you know, the history you, of Mr. Yeah, but you Nelson. did. You have a great collection now. Yeah. And then your challenge today is how do you add a contemporary collection of equal value? Yeah. Yeah. But you have a great historical collection. It is. And, and the historical collection came. Contrary to the Carnegie country, you know, uh, the Buffalo Art Museum, uh, the Albright Knox, Albright Knox yeah. has an amazing collection, and they also started like us in 1933. Now they were no, they began in 1827. They're the first art museum in America. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> you see why I like hanging out with a guy like him because he puts it back well, on the street. Actually, Wadsworth had the name was a few years before them. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. mm -hmm. Buffalo was so rich, you know, it was one of the richest cities in America. And they wanted a great museum, mm -hmm. and they built one. And the first incorporated the museum was Millard Fillmore, mm -hmm. the retired president of the United States. <laughs> That's a, not a bad way to go, no. as those transitions are. She might be running for 20. <laughs> so this is, if, if you heard this, the beginning of the campaign. Um, but, but so, well, going back to the Albright Knox, where they were buying Pollocks, and this, the, we were buying old Chinese masters. I remember they so. had a proviso in the Nelson Trust mm -hmm. that the artists had been, had been dead for 30 years yes. before you could buy their work. And the 30 years also meant that you could not kill a contemporary artist because you didn't have to wait too long. So even your favorite artist had to wait. But you look back, it wasn't so horrible, really. No, you know, the most contemporary work that we bought with the uh, endowment from Mr. Nelson was our Van Gogh uh, orchids. Yeah. And, and that way, it, it is, you put in perspective what you could be buying at that particular time. Although, our weakest link, and, and, and when I'm saying the weakest link is just also to show you that if you have any Brax Picasso's Cubist period that you want to donate to the Nelson, this is the time to do it because in 2018 we're showing greatest acquisitions that have come thanks to the munificence of all of you guys. Uh, so next year we're going to do a brilliant exhibition of all the great works that we have acquired. But that Modern spirit, the beginning of modernism, is where we have our biggest holes today. Yeah. And, and that is impossible to And you can't really No, today it's impossible. Yeah. Now, also, who remembers seeing the exhibition we did to celebrate the, 19, the 1914 war, the, the first World War War, with, when we did it with the World War One Museum and everything? And we had the most beautiful Kandinsky ever to be great in our world. That is thanks to this guy. He doesn't know it, but the fact that he loves Kansas City made it much easier by ask and begging. And he landed the most beautiful painting. And again, it's a painting that is very difficult to borrow. It is a major loan that we made, and it was we were felt so lucky to have it well, that's for such an expedient time. Good, but let's go now then. Good setup. Exactly, yeah. to the Guggen. You know, Julian yes. worked with the Guggen long before me. So. I, I just paved the way for him to show it. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it would be interesting for you to see it. Here it is. That's the Frank Lloyd Wright building, that curlicue building on Fifth Avenue. And behind it is the tower that he wanted to build <laughs> in 1959, but the family said, get lost. 
and it wasn't put up until 1991 by a different architectural firm. Mm -hmm. So that's where I went in 2008, just as the world was ending financially. <laughs> Brilliant decision. Yeah. Your father did not advise you that. <laughs> but it's been an interesting experiment mm -hmm. in adapting. So I feel very happy that I worked at the Whitney, which is an amazing museum, and ironically, the great German design building in New York, and now this place, which is the great German museum, designed by an American architect of the highest rank. But then, <laughs> both things happening. Mm -hmm. Then I thought I'd just show you after New York, well, there it is, and we're lucky because we get more than a million people a year to see the place, and it's very invigorating to have big audiences in the museum. Do you know, actually, I was, I was curating the Brazil show that happened there, and we were about to install. So the Brazil Body and Soul show exhibition was my curatorial debut for the Brueggemann, and this was 2011. 11. Yeah. And a very crucial moment. Now, uh, the design, the interior design was done by French architect uh, Jean Nouvel. And very interestingly, Nouvel decided to paint the interior, the whole building, black. Was that interesting? <laughs> it was psychologically, my interest in that was that he was trying to obliterate. Place. Exactly. <laughs> Let's forget now the details were that as, as he was completely obliterating that, the centerpiece that was a three-story high altarpiece from Olinda, uh, it started to have the centerpiece. So yes, it, there, there was a positive thing about it. Now, imagine this, and it is, so we were going to open sometime like all exhibitions open sometime late September, um, the exhibition, we're packing everything, designers are working, all of our art handlers are preparing cases, and the whole building had been empty, it's all painted, finally all black, there's a turf completely covering the, the, the skylight, so this is really a black shrine, all of a sudden, very dark, and a shrine, and as we're preparing to have this altarpiece that is packed in an airport that we had to extend the runway to be able to land at the Bluff to bring this altarpiece from Olinda all the way to New York City. We were ready to that and this is September 9, 10, we're preparing all of this and September 11 happens. And so all of a sudden the Guggenheim is a very special place on September 11. So uh, just because it was a few days ago, and I, I do, I think that is the day that my wife, Tasha, and I, and our baby son at the time, and son was only one year old, we became New Yorkers because this brought us all together. Piotrowski was visiting the Guggenheim that day, and we were all called to the auditorium. I was coming from a meeting with the founder of that Brazilian show, six million dollar budget for a one show. And we never had that. <laughs> for <laughs> Picasso, Donald awesome Trump, and it's the most expensive show we've done. And so that day, the Guggenheim became also a shrine. And people came. And people came. So I know how many people can come, even if you have no art, and yeah. even if the building is dark. But the beautiful thing is that after a lot of back and forth, we of course delayed the opening. But one of the, my most beautiful and greatest memories is that. The museum then decided we cannot open, we cannot finish installing the altar place. The altar had it, it took so many weeks just to put, but the, and the monks would not want it at one point. They were thinking not to lend it just because of what had happened, and they were threatened by security. But when everything changed, the monks not only allowed the, finally the, the this to travel, we were delayed. But we opened the show as we were installing. And these monks all agreed to come, and they did a mass, beautiful mass at St. Patrick's, and then they did a mass ceremony at the museum too. And it was just one of those moments in which the museum became also something more profound. And, and that would be, perhaps today, still one of my deepest moments of working at the Guggenheim. And it was just a transformative moment. The also good thing is that because of all the world changing, 
we extended the show from three months to six months, so it was the best attended show ever. It's <laughs> <laughs> just because it was run, run. <clears throat> well, there it is in New York. Then I think some of you may have been to the Peggy Guggenheim in Venice. So who has been to Venice? Just a quick show of hands, and, and this is one of the important places to go. And that's, as you probably know, unfinished palazzo on the Grand Canal. She's Solomon Guggenheim's niece. They weren't friendly. And she called the museum in New York the garage. <laughs> late in her life, she realized that her children weren't capable of maintaining her collection. So she gave the house and the collection to the foundation in New York. So we operate that as a subsidiary. And today, one of the things that most of you have enjoyed already is seeing down in our special projects exhibition space the mural that Peggy commissioned yeah. for uh, Pollock that was in her New York apartment yeah. and then was given. And you're having it soon, correct? Well, we hope so. Yeah. I mean, she's an unusual person in that she had a gallery in Paris, she had a gallery in London, actually the other order, she was in London first, then Paris. And as a Jew, she had to leave Europe, so she came to New York reluctantly after having left 30 years prior. And she opened a great space on 57th Street that was both a museum and a gallery called Art of the Century. And then after the war, she went back, she went to Venice where she felt strongly, and this place was a rundown, not very nice, you know, partially built palazzo. It's meant to be two stories higher, but the family ran out of money in the 17th century. And eventually she became sort of like the queen of Venice, and her collection was shown, and people could call and come see her, and, and then she made a show in New York of the collection, and after that she started thinking maybe that's where the ultimate uh, destination. But today we get about 475,000 people at this little tiny museum. And also that is what set your international yeah. outlook, yeah. correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you had been able to bring all the collection and sell the palace, perhaps the Guggenheim would not be the world True. brand name and, and, and the international museum that it is. And then about 25 years ago, the Basque government came to my predecessor, Tom Krenz, Julian's boss, and said, could you make a museum in this town called uh, Bilbao, which is basically the Pittsburgh of Spain. It was a teal <laughs> producing city that had a kind of introverted and very polluted life until the 1980s. <coughs> Here's the principal river, the Nevion, that goes from their bay all the way up into the center of the city. And Frank Geary designed this great building, which by common consent is the other most important building of the 20th century after Franklin Wright's Guggenheim. I thought you were going to say after Stephen Hall's expansion of the Nelson Atkins, but <laughs> the, the Nelson Atkins is the 21st century, so yeah. forget the 20th, this is 20th century still. Yeah. But it did change, this was a game changer. Yeah. This was a game changer in so many ways because all of a sudden architecture could be no longer rectilinear. Yeah. Architecture and modern and contemporary art could be something that would be whimsical. And it put, I mean, there is something called the Bilbao effect. I mean, everyone was wanting to replicate something like this. So two interesting points about this. This is the first major computer-assisted design building, a CAD building. So in the architecture world, it's quite important. And secondarily, as Julian said, it was a city that wasn't clear about its far identity, but by investing in this, changed its perception in the outer world. So today, about 1.1 million people visit this museum, and the city has about 1 million residents. You know that that's where my grandfather came from. I know, you're back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, there's connections, Kansas City, Bilbao, so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> so next month we celebrate the 20th anniversary and we're bringing all the trustees there. And so, if you remember the opening, so at the opening of Bilbao, and that is how the Basque Country goes with a bank to celebrate a museum, there was a bomb placed by ETA yeah. at the opening of that and they're trying to attempt it now. 
how the Basque country has also recognized this as their own symbol. Yeah. So that also is how culture helps change attitudes, yeah. which is very important. Yeah. So we, we're very proud of it. This is unlike uh, Venice. They have their own collection. We guide them in what they buy, and we guide them programmatically. But they're, on year 20, I must say, the curators there are becoming a little more uh, uh, independent in a way. So we exchange exhibitions, and we're deeply involved in the guidance of the place, but they've become their own entity. And it's tremendously attractive. Is there to be a contract that needs to be renegotiated? We just did it. You we just did it? Yeah, we did it about a year ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're and all Ignace is still there. Yep, one director the whole time, and we yeah. made a very good contract from my point of view. The new one. That's how also we gossip about the world. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and finally, I thought you might get a kick out of seeing this. This will be Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. This is in the Persian Gulf. Uh, again, designed by Frank Gehry. I inherited this project again from Tom Krenz. It's uh, three times bigger than Bilbao. Mm -hmm. So it's 21 stories high on four levels, and it's about a 580,000 square foot facility. So how many times bigger than the Nelson Atkins? Uh, this is the measure that we compare. What do you think? Said, how big is your square footage? Where is Karen? <laughs> <laughs> Karen, tell the numbers. I mean, but I, I, I what, what is that number? 400,000 square feet. Yeah, 1,000. But that's everything, including all the passageways. So we'll be slightly bigger than that at 530. And we have a lot of passageways. So this place is quite phenomenally overscaled, possibly. And we've been buying our port for the last seven or eight years. And Big things. Yeah, and they'll have a great collection beginning in 1965 mm -hmm. until now. And if you've been watching the news, the Louvre, Abu Dhabi, which is next to us, opens on November 9. 10 and 11, and the Louvre will take care of art from Lascaux until 1965. So this takes, so they were designing all of this island or this, this yeah. oasis of great art, and so this would take you from the yeah. This is an island, this is a 20 mile long sand island opposite a city that was built in the last 20 years that uh, now will have a Norman Foster Museum, which will be their National History Museum. The Guggenheim, the Louvre, 13 <coughs> resort hotels, NYU, the Sorbonne, and housing for about 40,000 people. And we were talking that you have maybe already a date in mind for opening of this, if everything goes right. Yeah, but I'm not able to say that. So, but <laughs> could we, so the, the reason you were invited today, so there was a, a secret, is would you invite all of us that were here? And if your ticket to this lecture gives you rights to be invited to the opening. <laughs> Unfortunately, it does. Unfortunately, it doesn't pay for your airfare. No, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll, all, we'll all manage our way back. But I think we should all come and join Richard to the opening. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> so let's go. At this, we still have two, three years to start saving for our airfare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let it longer than that? Okay. <laughs> So I think, in concluding, I'd say to you, Guggenheim New York, Guggenheim in Venice, Guggenheim in Bilbao, we hope someday in Abu Dhabi, and it all began in a way on Gladstone Boulevard and here on Oak Street. So that's what, the other thing I wanted to float as an idea is, could we call the Guggenheim Fifth Avenue Nelson New York? Or <laughs> Nelson Atkins New York, or the Galley? Because we're welcome you here in a way that we can call part of the network. So let's think about it. I mean, you know, one of the things that really museums don't do is merger acquisitions. You know, in, in the corporate world, and many of you are corporate world, it's like there are museums that their course has written and then they should. And what this moment starts to be is like, what is a global museum? Well, a global museum needs partners and everything. And we're discussing of some museums that should set sunset completely. They have run their course. And uh, well, that's not quite how I, I said they need to evolve. That's interpreted differently. But it is true that, and, and we both belong and we were discussing earlier at lunch, it's like there is AAMU that is like our, our, our brotherhood that, that 
guides in many of the things that we do. But yeah, the world is evolving, and, and museums tend to stagnify and uh, and do that. But you're defining a different. A well, different I, I actually I inherited all this, so I'm trying to execute it. It wouldn't typically have been my strategy. So would you kill this project if you no, could? No, I, I, I was very skeptical at the beginning, mm -hmm. and now I think, given the situation in the big world, mm -hmm. I think it's a important catalyst in people's understanding one another better. So we imagine about three and a half million people a year visiting this, mm -hmm. and the country in total only has about 1.6 million true Emiratis. Mm -hmm. You know, there are another five million workers there. But what it has is a crossroads effect between India and Africa mm -hmm. and the airports in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai now are 40% bigger than Heathrow. Mm -hmm. So there are such, a, such an unbelievable number of, of people traversing the region today. We see that as an audience. So and we see out of the three million, mm -hmm. one third of them will be from India. One third from India. How many from China? Or how does China play in all this? Today, China is not in the mix. China, mm -hmm. Chinese travelers tend to go over the North Pole mm -hmm. as it's faster. Mm -hmm. so. So, so, you mentioned two airports in the region have become hubs and everyone yeah. connecting through that. So, is this the right time also to bring this? We could be the biggest hub airport for <laughs> North, South. It, wouldn't this be perfect between Canada and Mexico to land here from Europe and just shop and go to Cancun? So, whatever we have heard about the airport, we cannot bring the Picasso show. It would cost us so much more, uh, less. It, we would be so much more efficient. We would be able to attract so many more international exhibitions. If we could have a better airport, we would land and clear works of art right. with a huge cargo, and we do not. So let alone from our capacity to travel and go to Europe directly to Kansas City, London, Frankfurt, wherever you want to go, but not even landing big cargoes has an impediment for the success of this museum. Not only the museum, we would only see, and I personally have a vested interest in everything parts, but as a region to get even Google or Amazon that is now thinking to here, yeah, an airport. So all of you who are let's go to the Now if it's Calatrava, it's gonna cost more. But we can have great designs and have a great airport, and we need a greater airport just to be able to attract, retain talent. So that was my political, uh, I said at least it's one or two political things. Uh, the other thing is, no, uh, he was asking me if I was going to be running for mayor. You know, everyone is running for mayor for uh, replacing the amazing mayor that we have. No, I'm really happy about my job here. But that was my political thing, we need a better airport. Um, we were talking earlier also about, so, the network of museums that we have, what does make, if, if my analogy of merger acquisitions and the bankers in this room know about that is because you need to be sustainable, you need to scale up, what is challenging the success of museums or what is challenging the, that the museums can survive in the next hundred years? As the models and the economy and everything has just been threatened, what, what keeps you awake at night about stability, making sure that our world will subside? Well, really, nothing keeps me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the exam <laughs> <laughs> But I will say, I think we need to make certain that the museum is welcoming to the broadest possible audience. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, the experience of looking at art is very different from handheld device, mm -hmm. but it's not a bad way to begin an introduction to the visual universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worried about the next hundred years. Because we will not be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy, right? <laughs> no, because I, I do worry. The thing is, I do this. Wake up at night with those chills and thinking, how, how is our world going to subside? It will will continue. Yeah. It will mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. So should we open it for questions for this great audience? And a lot of, you can also ask family questions. I know a, fam, a lot of family members and friends, so. And also, if you have an anecdote 
of when he was a child here in Kansas City. We want to know about it because there's reasons why at 16 he left Kansas City. Uh, so there must be something there. So anyone, anyone, I will, I will repeat the question because we're live through internet, thanks to Facebook, we're all streaming this. So every, everyone who couldn't come here is because I stayed at home in the comfort of Facebook, visioning in their handheld devices that, of course, is different from being live here. Your first question, yes. Uh, well, first, thank you for coming to Kansas City to see us here. Uh, I especially do appreciate it because I aspire to be one of you guys someday. <laughs> um, currently, we I'm might discourage you, though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. Well, you guys are having a great time. <laughs> uh, I'm actually a preservationist and guide at another local museum, the Stephen Arabia. Mm -hmm. Remind me your name again. My name is Claire. Claire works at the Arabia Museum. Who has visited the Arabia Museum downtown? Fabulous. <laughs> it is one of the great treasures of Kansas City. And the question is, how do we make museums relevant for millenniums, which sometimes don't feel welcome, don't feel, don't feel that they participate. And if we don't capture them and they don't visit today, maybe we are losing part of the pipeline of, of being welcome or successful in the museum. So how would you answer that, Richard? I don't have an answer, but I would say this. I'm sure in the 1960s, our parents thought it's the end of the world also. <laughs> they don't want to do anything. Who are they? They're crazy. Mm -hmm. I think the minute they have a child of their own, things start turning around. And I think you, I wouldn't worry in the long term. Millennials <laughs> are a new category. We were called hippies. You know? <laughs> it's a, these are evolving states that very quickly break apart as people age. So go on doing really important work, take care of that boat, and you'll be happy into the future. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say that we're trying different things, and, and maybe that is my wannabe hippie attitude. Uh, but it is trying to segment things that people feel comfortable. So well, the Nelson, for many, clever, yeah. for many years, felt like we're on the top of a hill, we are. Uh, but it was felt that even if we were free and that messaging was not coming through that way, that we were the place where you would bring your family on a special visit, but not the, a place that you would visit often. And so that started to feel that way, saying, what would make a repeat visitation? And so today for millennials specifically, uh, the, there are programming. So it, it is really programming. And I'm, Adam, who's somewhere around here in our education wing, Adam programs all of our education programs, but it is segmenting different things because you cannot program a lecture like this. If we see ourselves, we don't have a lot of millennials. Just raise your hand, millennials here. Uh, we, yeah, we paid you to come. So, this is family members, of course, of, 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 of Richard. No? No. Okay, they just happen to be here. What happened? Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Well, but. It is true that every program has like a different profile, but have you been here for our third Thursday? For Wednesday. Yeah, so third Thursday is from Millennium, so we create a program, there's music, there's things, and so that is really... Now, there is days that we happen to be on a third Thursday, we have a very scholarly lecture here, with a scholar that we're flying from somewhere, and not a long time ago we had a Renaissance vocal concert in the uh, our 14th century um, cloister. cloister. And what was great is that this place is big enough to accommodate three different programs, three different audiences, and that is on a good day. My staff and I are thinking like seven programs on the same day is maybe too much. So they're trying to slow down the program. 
But it is true that when the concert in the cloister that was that also, and one of the things we're doing a lot is collaboration with other entities. We can do it all by ourselves, but also Kansas City needs that we all come together. So for instance, that concert was with Cynthia's program called, and we have the chair of that great institution. It is? Okay. Uh, Chamber music, exactly. Uh, the Friends of Chamber Music brought a beautiful concert in our cloister. Then we had a lecture here, and then we had third Thursday. But as three different generations and three different, very different audiences went out, all of a sudden say, this is a happening place, and we had a confluence of a lot of things. And the collection just thrives from that. So what I would say is, Programming, 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 programming is the answer. So, I don't know, do you have a beer day at the Arabia? <laughs> so, and I, will come, and I will try to come just to pretend I'm younger than I am. So, those are the things I do. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes? What do you think about a museum, you know, somewhere in the United States, be assessing their works to, for a capital game of their principal building? Remind me your name again. Ivan. Ivan is asking, what do we think about museums that would the accession works of art to preserve the infrastructure of the building? And I think maybe you're 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 bringing. There is a museum today in uh, Pittsfield, the Massachusetts, yeah. that is going to that, and uh, among the works that they're the accessioning, there would be a marvelous. Uh, Wyeth. Wyeth and also um, American art. I mean, uh, Nan, please tell us. Rockwell, there are the beautiful Rockwell. So there, there are, and Rockwell span and Rockwell gave it to that museum because it was close within. So what do you think? And we were discussing, actually, a great question because we were discussing it at lunch, where we are with that. Uh, I think we have to be cautious, but I think it's wrong to say it's better that you close than to sell one painting. So this AAMD group that Julian's an officer of and believes in, <laughs> their attitude is better that you close than sell one painting. I find that really indefensible. And on the other side, I mean, and, and, and we've been discussing this for a long time. So, what this museum is suggesting is that they want to change their mission. So one museum that did it masterfully, and I have to give enormous credit to the director then, and uh, that was uh, Louis Gratchus. Louis Gratchus, when he was in the Albright Knox, and Karen Fisher had worked with uh, him earlier, but Louis, when he was at the Albright Knox, which is focused mostly in modern and contemporary, so really the collection that we're talking about, found it more or less with, with great art. He had the responsibility to the accession of some works. And, and I was the head of the committee. And you, hmm? I was the head of the But you were the head of the committee. I was at AMD depending that at that time on the board. It was very, I don't unpopular. Board board. Very, it was very popular, but he did it by the book. And it is the best example of, if you're going to the accession, to strengthen the core program. And he was redefining what that museum should be. Yeah. And so that is one of the best examples. But he was also doing it not, and this is what I think AMD, and that's why you cannot have a blank statement because everything is, if he were doing it because there were leaks that that museum could not fundraise for and, and, and take care of their envelope or take care of the essential things, what happens is that you sell them one painting to take care of the leak. And then five years later, you have to sell another painting for taking care of the leak. And then you, la you sell your last painting for taking care of the leak. And then all of a sudden, the leak doesn't matter because you have your more paintings. But in the meantime, the museum was open for 12 more years. But, well, but <laughs> the Albright Knox did it the best of both worlds is that they sold a beautiful ancient Chinese thing that we would love to have bought, but we didn't, uh, and, and some other things. And they strengthen their corpus to buy contemporary art. Yeah. But they have always been doing a great job. So those are those are the things. And I don't know enough about this particular Massachusetts Institute to, to, to know where they're going. But um, we you should have bought the Chinese art. <laughs> you want the Chinese art? We're not selling it. No, <laughs> We're not selling it. We should have bought the Albright Knox. 
Oh, from the Ulbricht. Yeah, yeah, that was a long time ago. The old Dutch ship. That was what? What year was that? Like, it was 15 years ago. Yeah, 15. I was at the Missile Park at the time. So anyway. But a great question. I think we have time to two more questions, and I see one here and one here. Let's go first there. Yes? So, 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 again, Sharon Hoffman is asking what can museums do today so that people appreciate the masterpieces of tomorrow? Was that right? I'd say the most important thing is to expose them to them. So, if you're not collecting and exhibiting contemporary art, you're cheating your audience. And if you are, and trying, as Julian saying, bring in as many people as possible to look at what it is you're doing. And I think your attendance has changed hugely, hasn't it, in the last several years? Yeah. Almost not dead. <laughs> <laughs> last question, yes. I know you changed the admission in a few years back and made it free to most galleries. Uh, has that worked? Is that a good thing? Some other cities have done that. Is, is that working or um, is that a good policy? Remind me your name again. My name is Bob. So Bob is asking if the change from charging admission to the museum to going free for the collection has changed and, and been benefit and how is that working? So first of all, one of the things that attracted me to come to Kansas City is that that policy was in place when I came. So that policy is really goes back to a great board, my predecessor Mark Wilson and Karen Christensen, that looked at the what we were doing and saying at a time that we were going to be close for the renovation and the expansion, going free was going to be important, and that then as we expanded and we had a parking lot and some other ways of mitigating that revenue, that being free, as public libraries, so I'm a true believer also in public libraries, and true believer of public education, I would not be here, and, and this is just because I'm about to put a kid through college, who's 17 right now and he's going next year, I would not be sitting in front of you if I were not the beneficiary of free colleges in France. I went to the Louvre and the college, L'Ecole du Louvre and I did the Sorbonne both at the same time because there was no cost. If I had had to pay, I would not have done two courses, I might not be here today. So I'm 100% between public education, 100% uh, being free because it is what our founders, the, the endowments that we have, the founders, allowed us to have a collection that people would enjoy. So because this museum was free, is that and because of his advice of going to Andre, that not only I applied, but I'm here today. Um, but it has worked. Now, if you see most of the peers against which we compete and compare ourselves to a lot of peers that are similar, not in the coasts, that in cities that are up and coming, and many are free. We charge for exhibitions because exhibitions do cost us an extra amount of money and we need to try to make some revenue. But overall, it has worked, and it has worked because of how our house has incorporated that the parking, the restaurants, and everything make up for some of the revenue we would have lost by not charging. But the uptake that a lot of people can come for free is super important. Now, one of the things also, how do we make for that gap is because of membership. So right now, excuse me, I'm going to be so shameless about saying membership. <laughs> many of you are members, many of you are friends of our, many of you are already society fellows. The thing I can only encourage you is upgrade your membership levels. There's more things to enjoy, but your membership at any level is already giving us the possibility of bringing this museum for free to our community. And this is one of our tenets and something that we truly believe. So people say, hey, but my $100 check is that it's not the metric. It is, it allows to open for free, it allows to pay for that ball that we changed that no philanthropist in the city wants to pay for that ball, let me tell you. <laughs> but your membership allows to be open and free. So shamelessly, if you're already a society, who, how many friends of art do we have tonight? How many Society of Fellows? All right, for all the Friends of Art, 
Oh, great to society of fellows. <laughs> and I'm giving you a hint. The rates might change. So this is the good time to do it, please. So this is, you see, this is the kind of problems you have in a bar. Like, <laughs> I could go to prison. What is it called when, when you say secret information that you know? Insider trading. So okay, please don't tell me because I could go for prison because of insider trading. But anyway, your generosity makes this museum free, and what it makes it is that we can bring around 50 to 70,000 children free of charge to this museum. And for many of these children, it's the first time they come to have an experience. It is the first time they come to have an experience. And then we're able. Now, bringing those children, just to finish that thought, we have to pay for the bus to bring them to schools. We have to pay for a substitute teacher to stay at school. But all of that is worth it when one of those children that come and we give them a card saying that the museum is free, they bring it back home and they bring the parents, the parents who have never come to the museum. All of a sudden you have a kid that is the guide for their parents. Maybe you and I, our parents drag us to museums. This is just changing them. Yeah. They come up and everything. Mm -hmm. Question, one last question before we celebrate this man. As do you, and yes. When are we going to get an app for our phone that serves as our membership, admission card, and parking? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do, uh, so remind me your name again. Joe Ford. So Joe Ford is asking <laughs> if we're going to get an app that will help us that in the app you have already your membership net number scanned and that you also you scan that as you go to the parking. And I'm trying to look for Doc, Doc <laughs> Allen. Uh, is Doc Allen in the audience? Mm -hmm. Doc Allen is a guru for everything technology. And I don't know, it should happen. Uh, tomorrow, Doug Allen will be severely reprimanded for loving <laughs> <laughs> He's a digital guy, so I know Doug Allen is watching this in YouTube in the cover of his home, and he's in pictures. But if not, we will make sure that we can do that, because, yeah, you don't know exactly if you have your card. Now, to answer it in a different way, we just did a survey uh, from, with all our membership to see how many people we loved receiving our members' magazine, how many people wanted to go all digital and everything, and we still have 50-50, so we're still going to be having a card and also a card that you can take to another museum like the Guggenheim in New York where we have reciprocal exchanges at a certain level of membership. So the card is physical, but you also will have something digital. We're working on that. Mr. Ford, join the Guggenheim. We already have that app. <laughs> Kansas City, guiding you to come to Kansas City, as I have had the pleasure and the immense honor of having a friend as Richard. So Richard, thank you. Thank you for being here. I'd already, you know, I'd already hopped on.